As some of you may know, my wife is the only child of two only children. And so when we got married, it was big doings. It was a three-day circus with many rings involved. There was the, the full rehearsal dinner. We filled up the pear tree with that. I've never been to a 100-person rehearsal dinner before, before I got to my own. And then there was uh, the, the day itself. We rented a mansion. There is a mansion northwest of Macon. And uh, we had, it was a big enough shindig that we had two chocolate fountain mabobber thingies. And it was just big. And uh, then the next day we had a brunch, because if you have that many people together, you might as well keep on eating. And yet in all of that, there was not a moment in which I thought, I'm married. Wow. When it happened was the day after, on Monday. We were driving to uh, Michigan for our honeymoon, and we were stopping somewhere in the middle of flat Indiana, and we pulled off the highway, and, and, and Olivia looked at me and said, what do you want for dinner? And uh, I looked there and said, well, there's a Taco Bell right there. And I went, whoa. <laughs> that was it. With that line, there's a Taco Bell right there. I realized we, have now be, we are now married. Like, we're going to have this discussion. And 4,973 dinners later, I'm still going to ask that. We're going to still have that discussion tonight. What are you going to have for dinner? Right? That, that was the moment it, it sank in. And so uh, here's the thing that happens. That, that's the, the, the question that seems to be what defines a married couple. What do you, the, the people who ask, what do you want for dinner again and again? Is at a certain point, there's a third person who shows up in the family. And then what do you want for dinner is joined with the second question. It's the second question we ask every night. What is the question you ask, what do you want for dinner when you are a parent? What will the children eat? Right? Because it pains me deeply that my children still prefer a hot dog and mac and cheese to anything I cook. They don't believe me when I say I'm a decent cook, and I hope it changes one day, but uh, I'm still waiting. And, and so this is what happens, right? What, what will we have for dinner, and what will the children eat? And... Um, even when the, 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 a couple gets away, like Olivia and I, we went over to Hannibal for dinner. My parents watched the kids. Um, we went to a place called La Bana. Have you heard of La Bana? Can I confess it took me an embarrassing, embarrassingly long time to realize that that was Hannibal spelled backwards? Yeah, that was sad. <laughs> and we sit down to eat dinner together, just the two of us. And you know what we talked about? talk about the children, right? Because once, once that third person shows up, that's, you, you can't ever get away from that. The, 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 the question, what do you want for dinner, now it has the second part, and what will the kids eat? That is permanently attached. Mary and Joseph, it's the same for them. Exact same, right? There's some differences in details, but I, I have a feeling that when they handed off baby Jesus to uh, Mary's mother, Anne, and said, here, we'll hold on to Jesus for the night. We're, we're going out. You know what they talked about? Potty training Jesus. Now, I'm sure the details of potty training Jesus were a little bit different, or maybe not. I don't know. But that's, that's what they talked about, right? There is an artist named Peter Bruegel, uh, who in 1566 painted a picture that captures this in a way that I am amazed at, and it is on the front of your bulletin. And so Peter Bruegel the Elder uh, paints this picture, and it is, it is of the census, of Peter and Mary going to the census. And he writes, or he paints this, and he paints it with what he knows. This is not the Middle East, this is the, the mountains of Europe. And, and I tell you that this is a painting of Mary and Joseph as they're showing up for the census. And as you look at this painting, can you tell where Mary and Joseph are? Can you find them? It takes a second, doesn't it? They're front and centered. They're down at the bottom that, on that black donkey right at the bottom. That, that's Mary wrapped up in a cloak, and in front of that donkey is, is uh, Joseph. But what it's getting at there is this sense of like, most of the time when you see a painting of Mary or Joseph or Jesus and all this, it's like, 
like big old lights are shining on, on the Holy Family, right? It, it's like impossible to miss what's going on. And, and this painting, it, I like this because this, this is what happened that day they rolled in for the census. Like they got there and everyone else is doing their thing. If you look at the painting, like there's the dude peeking out the window on the, on the left. He's looking down at the, on the line at the bottom and that line of people are the people who are showing up to pay their taxes and there's the snowball fight in the back and they're building a, a barn further back into the painting and there's the person putting on there's their uh, ice skates on the right like as you look through this painting every single person has the same amount of detail as Mary and Joseph every single person has the same sense of they're they're living their life they're just doing what it is that that is is in front of them for that day and for Joseph, you know what Joseph was dealing with? Government paperwork and having a problems with traveling. That, that has to be. If you haven't experienced that wonderful combination of government paperwork and struggling with a hotel, like, I'm not sure you've really lived. Like, this is what Joseph is dealing with. And, and in just a few hours, everything is going to change. And are they going to know that? No. And the next day, they're just going to get up and do their thing. All the people in this painting. There are only two people in this painting who realize everything has changed. It's, it's a husband and wife who become a mother and a father. And from that day forward, Mary and Joseph go from asking what's to dinner for to asking what's for dinner and what's Jesus going to eat. Right? There's that second question. Everything changes now because that third person has shown up. And now they have to ask that second question. Here we are in the middle of Advent. It's the beginning of the church year. And from here, it feels like once we launch ourselves out from Advent, things get big. Right? The, the wise men show up from the east and they have like geopolitical connotations because they're from the east and that's where invasions come out of. And that's big. All of Jerusalem is afraid, we read. And from there, John the Baptist is going to show up and all of Israel is going to be confused by this weird dude out in the wilderness. And he is calling hundreds of people to get baptized. And then Jesus shows up and starts moving around the country and outside the country and it gets to the point where all of Jerusalem is, is lined up as he enters town. Like We have some very big events coming, but we don't get big yet. Like Advent is really, really small. Advent is this very small moment when a husband and wife are preparing to become a mother and a father. Their entire world is going to change as two people become three. And I think that is just so important for us to notice about Advent. It is about this small but important and essential change. And indeed, like you just think about, anyone here hold a newborn recently? You don't have to say anything, I know. But like a newborn fits from like here to here, they're so bitty. And, and I had no clue when I saw, you see commercials for babies, and they're always like six months old already, and their eyes track, and they're sort of cute and pudgy already, and they're, they're, they're bigger, but like small, right? And so Mary and Joseph, they're getting ready for this small change that's going to change everything. And it's not going to change everything in some sort of like magic. It's the changes that happen when a husband and wife welcome a child into their lives. To prepare for the birth of Jesus, I am finding it far more fitting to how the story is told, far more realistic to my own experience of worship and reading scripture, my own experience of following Jesus. To see this as something that is very small, right? That, that's between two people when we invite Jesus to be the third person in that relationship. You see, it's not just a husband and wife that, that, that welcome Joseph, Jesus in and become mother and father, and then that changes that relationship. Jesus becomes a third person between any two people, if we think about it. Right? I am a different husband than I would be if Jesus wasn't the third person with my wife and I, right? We, I handle repentance and confession and forgiveness differently because it's not just Olivia and I. Olivia and I both have Jesus, right? It's not just how do I treat Olivia, it's how do I treat Olivia and what does Jesus think about that? Right? It's, it's the same with, with my, my children. It's not just how do I raise my children, how do I raise Fletcher? It's how do I raise Fletcher and what would make Jesus smile as Fletcher grows up? It's true of my friends. When I, I, I think of the friends that I have 
Well, I am far more honest and forthright with them because it's not just how do I treat my friend. It's what, what was Jesus say about how friendship works? And, and the truth will set you free. And so I will tell the truth because I want my, my friends to be free. And, and I am, I'm far more forward with that. Right? My relationships to the churches I serve, to the, you, each, each of you, right? the, my relationships between me and any other person are different because it's not just how do I treat you. It's how do I treat you as someone who has invited Jesus to have a say in how this relationship unfolds, right? It's that second question. It's not just what do you want to have for dinner? It's what do you want to have for dinner? What are the children going to eat, right? That second question matters. Advent is the time when we start asking that, that second question, which it by no means is for me to claim that I have somehow become perfectly Christ-like and now all of my relationships are perfect. I have plenty of examples I can give you if you need a proof of that. But it is worth pondering what would it mean during this season of Advent to look at each of our close relationships and think about. It's not just how do I treat this person, but what does Jesus think about how we treat each other? All right? Does that make sense? Right? Well, inviting Jesus to have a say in each of our individual relationships because... In the end, there's no such thing as a family. There's a set of, there are individual relationships that build a family. There's no such thing as a church, right? There's a set of individual relationships that we each have that, that we can name as church. There's no such thing as a community. What there is is a bunch of individual relationships that we have that collectively we can call community. So to say that we invite Jesus to be the third person in each of our individual relationships can change everything, but it changes everything one relationship at a time. We are preparing to celebrate the birth of Jesus and to look at the way his birth changes the world. I think it is essential to remember that this change happens one relationship at a time, not magical, not some grand sweeping flash, but in concrete and tangible ways in the same way that Mary and Joseph had to learn to go from asking, what's for dinner? to what's the child going to eat too, and the same, that's what we do, right? Not just how am I going to treat this person, but what does Jesus have to say about how we treat this people? We, we, like Mary and Joseph, receive the first gift of Christmas as we invite Jesus to be part of each of our individual relationships. And, and the best news of all is it is not something that you have to deserve. It's not something you have to do good or else you don't get. There's no, there's no, this is just pure gift. This is the gift of Christmas. I hope we can each receive it and be transformed by it one day at a time. Amen.